Human identity is important. Why? Because with human identity, we are able to function within our society, more or less. We are able to recognize people. Like, if I'm looking for the one in my life, I want to be able to identify her in a big crowd of people and track her down. Human identity is simply the fact, the result of the fact that we are not identical. We are all different, because genetically we are different. Indeed, our DNA determines who we are and what we look like. Now, how do we establish someone's identity? By looking at his or her DNA? No. We look at the differences that we see between people. And those differences are most prominently expressed in our face. In fact, our face is a biological billboard of our identity, displayed to the rest of the world. And someone's facial identity can be investigated by the process of characterization. The identity of my face, for example, is defined by the fact I have a very small, upturned nose, a prominent chin and a prominent forehead, features that are emphasized in the caricature. Now, our facial identity is important to us, and I'm not sure if you heard about the latest developments in Facebook, for example, in which they've developed this computer software that is able to identify people in any picture they have online, even in pictures that you are not aware of that you're actually in the picture. Now, for a lot of people, that is scary because we want to control to whom we show our facial identity to. Now, faces are also highly dynamic. If I tell you a joke, you laugh, unless the joke is really bad, of course, but then you might have the courtesy to smile. My face is also changing in time, through aging, which you see simulation here, which is myself in 20, 30 years from now. And I often use this kind of simulation to figure out the kind of woman that I'm currently dating. I would show her this result at the first or second date, depending on the timing, and I would tell her, like, listen, if you want to take this relationship seriously, you have to take this into account. I will change. I will look like this, whether you like it or not. Now, considering my success in relationships so far, that's probably the reason why I'm still single today. <laughs> Although there is one particular person here in the audience who should pay a bit more attention, and I hope her feet are not cold at the moment. <laughs> Nevertheless, faces are fascinating, and it certainly became my passion to study faces 15 years ago during my PhD. I often stare at people's faces in public to a point where it really becomes embarrassing and people asking me, why are you staring at me? But sorry, sir, your face is scientifically so attractive. <laughs> you should see the expression on his face. And the thing I'm currently investigating in strong collaboration with Mark Schreiber from the Penn State University is the link between our DNA on the one hand and our face on the other hand. Imagine we can establish the relationship between both. That would mean we should be able to predict the face from DNA. So if I find some DNA traces left behind on cigarette butts or chewing gum, I would be able to trace back the evidence back to the person who left it behind just by looking at his or her face. Let's start at the beginning with a proof of concept, which is seen in identical twins. Identical twins are genetically 100% alike, and so is their face. In other words, the same DNA profile generates the same face. And twins have always been a very interesting study uh, subject. Not just identical twins, but also fraternal twins, like the ones you can see here. And for a long time, twins have been our only window on how to figure out the genetic architecture of our faces. What we also know is that when two people are genetically different, so is their face. And if we increase the genetic difference, we will increase the facial difference. And this kind of variation, the way it is segregated, is nicely observed within families. On top, you see my, my parents. In the middle, you see myself with my brother and my two sisters. And on the bottom, you see our offspring. You're probably all familiar with sayings like, hey, you've got your father's nose. Now, luckily for me, I've got my mom's eyes and mouth. Unfortunately, I've got my father's forehead and lack of hair. And I'm not talking about this part. But what we can see is that we indeed share a lot of similarity with our parents, because 50% of our DNA comes from our father, and the remaining 50% comes from our mother. So hence these likenesses and these comments that people make. What we also see, if we look at the next generation, they only share 25 instead of 
with my parents and all their grandparents. In other ways, this is how genetic variation is segregated over different generations. Now, if we zoom out from families to local communities, to local regions, countries, continents, and finally the whole world, that's why we see a whole range of genetic variability on the one hand and facial variability on the other hand, which is the result of many, many, many generations during evolution. And starting from the proper databases in which you collect DNA and faces of different populations across the world, you're actually able to study the differences between those populations in terms of genetics and faces. And as such, you are able to, to change the genetic background of faces, which I will illustrate here. Myself, I live in Antwerp, Belgium, and what I will do here is I will change my genetic background to different regions in the world. And we start our journey by going to Italy, not too far away. And what you can see changing in my face most prominently is, the, is my nose is being elevated like the typical Roman nose. The next stop on our trip is Tokyo, Japan. And what you see happening is that my typical European profile is changing into an Asian profile where the zygomatic structures are moving forward and the chin is slightly pressed backwards. Let's continue across the oceans, all the way to the other side of the world, and we end up in Mexico. The Mexican me has very smooth and rounded features, so everything is less sharp and pointy. If we travel up north to the States, more particularly Utah, we see the opposite effect. My features are becoming more prominent, and actually my skin is slightly paler than, than it is back in Europe. And in order to close the circle, we will end in West Africa. In the next slide. Yeah. And what you see changing here is changes in the lower jaw and the nose, besides skin pigmentations, which we could also see in the other simulations. Now, an interesting conclusion from these kind of studies is the fact of, of the concept of race as we know it does not exist. What we see in the world is a continuous spectrum of genetic variability linked with a continuous spectrum of facial variability. These simulated brothers are my brothers from across the world, but are genetically strongly related to me. We share the same identity, but within different populations. There are two more populations in the world that are clearly different, both genetically as well as facially. And I'm talking about males and females. We all know that males and females have certain characteristics in their faces that we use to recognize a male from a female. Although I must admit, depending on the time, and the place you are, and the amount of alcohols you drink, it might become confusing, but nevertheless, in general, there are differences between males and females. And that has to do with the fact that males and females have been selected for different reasons during evolution. Like, males have typically been selected for being strong and able to provide, and females have typically been selected for being fertile and producing offspring. And those selection criteria have shaped our faces today. Now, you're well aware that those selection criteria definitely have changed. Women are much more independent, and instead of looking for the alpha male, they're looking for a beta male, someone they can talk to and relate to. So I'm actually curious how the faces of men will look like in the future. Nevertheless, if we round up all those population-based studies, we can probably explain, explain up to 30% of the total facial variability that we see in the world. That also implies that we still have to explain 70%. With the 30% we have explained so far, we can actually establish the population an individual's DNA profile belongs to. So in my case, that would be a European male. But of course, here in Europe, there are a lot of males fitting that description. So in order to establish my identity within my population, we need to tackle the remaining 70%. And that's where the biggest challenge is remaining, because it involves the study of genetic variations within a population. And in order to tackle this, we need to find genes, specific locations in your DNA that are affecting your face. And those genes are known as craniofacial genes. Craniofacial genes have been discovered by studying genetic disorders. In such disorders, parts in your DNA are broken, and we often see that. If you have a group of patients in which the same part of their DNA is broken, they often share the same facial characteristics which is illustrated here for the Down syndrome. Actually, the characteristics of the Down syndrome have been photoshopped onto the faces of athletes, well-known athletes here in Belgium, as part of a campaign for the Special Olympics, because they want to make people aware that athletes participating in the Special Olympics deserve as much attention as athletes participating in the normal Olympics. 
But of course, you can imagine that the discovery of genes in this way is slow and complex, because actually you are relying on when things go wrong in nature. And it's not until recently that we have developed, in collaboration with Penn State University, a technique that is able to investigate the effects of individual genes on normal range faces, people like you and me, which can be sampled by the thousands. And in this slide here, I'm just showing one of such genes and the effect. The gene is called LRP6, and we can clearly see that this gene, gene is playing around with the lips. On the one hand, on the far right, right you have very thick bulges sticking out lips, just like Pamela Anderson, but this time genetically constructed instead of surgically. And on the other hand, you have very thin falling inward lips. So depending on the code that you have on this particular gene, your lips will be shaped more to one end or to the other. And we currently have done this exercise for about 200 genes. So where does it bring us today? On the one hand, we have the population studies. On the other hand, we have 200 genes to play around with. Can we predict a face from DNA? And in order to show what we can do today, I have made two such predictions that you can visually see here. And for you to appreciate the results, these are the actual people. The guy on the right, actually, is Mark Shriver, my collaborator on this journey. And as you can see, these results are visually pleasing. However, we must be honest. With the knowledge we have gathered so far, we are probably able to explain 35 up to 40%, which is already more than the 30% we were explaining before. But still, there is a long way to go. There is much more work to be done. But imagine, in let's say 10 years or so, and we continue to do our efforts and improve the results, we come to a point in which we are actually confident about our predictions, what can we do with it? And the first most obvious application is, of course, the establishment of criminal identity. During crime scene investigations today, quite often DNA evidence is found in hair, blood samples, saliva. In Belgium, about 4,000 DNA profiles are currently active in one or more investigations. 67% of those profiles have been identified by just matching the DNA to a database of known DNA profiles. That also means that 33% remains unidentified. It's close to 1,300 profiles. And in order to help those investigations out of an impasse, the prediction of the face from DNA could help. Another kind of application is in the establishment of historical identity. Imagine you find the remains of Cleopatra or the Mona Lisa from which you can extract DNA. As such, we can actually investigate if Cleopatra had indeed this big, beautiful nose that she was so famous for. And did Leonardo da Vinci actually paint the Mona Lisa as she looks like? Or did he change her or him? Another type of historical identity has to do with our own ancestors, which is done in genealogy. If, you have a if you're bringing a family in today and you would type the DNA of the current generation of a family, you are able to reconstruct the DNA of your ancestors. And as such, you can also predict their faces. So it's very much like creating a family photo album all the way back to Christ. And even beyond the Air One, through a recent and quite interesting study, one has shown that there are traces in our DNA that actually originate from the Neanderthal. What if we could use those traces in our own DNA to reconstruct the appearance of the Neanderthal? Or at the very least, try to figure out what the facial features are that we have that, or that we inherited from the Neanderthal. And finally, instead of looking back to history, one can also look at the future. From a the moment there is a pregnancy, you can actually extract the DNA from your future child, and you, you can predict the phase of your child at the age of 20 or 25. Now, a bit more science fiction, but with the advancements in genetic engineering, one could actually design your baby. You could create a DNA profile, creating a certain desired outcome. However, is this really something we want to do? What if you don't like the prediction of your future child? Just throw it away, start over? And what if we create a perfect-looking human? The result would be that we all look the same, which is a disaster for our facial identity. There is no more identity left. So instead of creating the perfect human, you create a dysfunctional society with a lot of psychologically disturbed individuals. Nevertheless, it's quite interesting to know that whenever I talk about facing your DNA in public, this is where the story ends. This is where the discussion takes place. People always focus on the bad things. However, one should not forget the good things, like putting a peace of mind to a rape victim. But you can feel the tensions, nevertheless, around this kind of technology, which implies that a lot of ethical debates 
and legal regulations are to be taking place. As a matter of fact, here in Belgium, the law is restricting me to use this kind of technology, even during crime scene investigations. Now, is this law outdated or actually highly accurate and relevant? I don't know. But what I do know is that you should appreciate the imperfections and variations in faces that you see around you, and that you should not try to change those variations and this variability. And when you look at your own face, put a smile to it. <laughs>